right there. David? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Elwood. Please be seated. Um, my name is David Elwood, and my job is to get off the stage as quickly as possible. Uh, we have an extraordinary treat tonight uh, in that we have Yo-Yo Ma here with us. Uh, once in a generation, a, perform a classically trained perf a performer becomes so remarkable in their capacity to give voice uh, to extraordinary pieces of music uh, that captures our imagination, uh, carries us on the wings of their, of their insights and views and emotions and everything else, so that even without crossing to the pop world, they become a household name. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma is, is such a person. Um, one of the most extraordinary things about him, besides his music where he started, he was, you know, he started at age four, educated at Juilliard, also at Harvard. And by the way, I was at Harvard the same time. So I was really quite involved in, yeah, that's right. We are in Courier, <laughs> Courier House together. Um, uh, but he's, um, you know, he's won every conceivable award in this business. He's been involved in everything from the World Economic Forum to receiving the Crystal Award, the Presidential Medal of Honor, the National Medal of Arts, and so forth. Um, but he also serves as a UN Messenger of Peace and as a member of the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities. Uh, he's just performed for eight presidents. Um, and uh, the only reason I hesitate to do that is it fades through slightly. So, but uh, he's just extraordinary uh, in, in so many different ways. And he, he's, he's, he, Presented on the occasion of the 56th inaugural of. No, I may have played for eight presidents, but he worked for four. <laughs> <laughs> Big difference. You're yeah. more successful. No. <laughs> it's worse than that. He played for presidents that he worked for presidents you didn't play for. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's not true. <laughs> but what is equally uh, extraordinary is his the fact that he's also used music in so many ways to make a huge difference about bringing the world together, becoming a cultural entrepreneur, a cultural messenger in so many ways. The, uh, in 1998, he established the Silk Road Project, which is to, quote, promote the study of cultural, artistic, and intellectual traditions along the ancient Silk Road route that stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to the Pacific Ocean. If you've ever had a chance to hear or participate or hear those musicians, with or without uh, Yo-Yo Ma, it is a truly meaningful and, and um, compelling experience. Um, they are now, the Silk Road Group has have uh, commissioned more than 60 different works of different, in different traditions. They now have done, are doing work in New York City with the schools, and they have major projects in the, I guess in the, in the middle schools, isn't it? Uh, Multidisciplinary projects and the like. And um, he's, he's, um, done everything from work with the faculty around Harvard to teach here uh, at Harvard master's programs. But most importantly, he has served as an ambassador for cultural understanding, bringing us together, and leadership. The Kennedy School aspires to all the things that um, this man represents. I cannot tell you how honored we are to have Yo-Yo Ma here. Please give him a big hand. <laughs> okay. Now we've already introduced David Gergen a little bit, and I'm going to keep it very short. David okay. has served four presidents, not played for eight, um, and uh, his he he too has been a source of remarkable inspiration. His work here is as leader of the Center for Public Leadership. He also seems to have another job at CNN or something. Uh, <laughs> As I've always loved to say, when, uh, when David spoke on CNN, everybody listened because you didn't know what he was going to say ahead of time. And that's what He didn't it. either. <laughs> <laughs> so now let me get off the stage and give uh, these two a chance to, to uh, reward us with their insights. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, David. Thank you. <clears throat> And, and thank you all of you very much for coming this evening. We're delighted to see you. This is an evening, as you might imagine, we've looked forward to for a long time. And you not only see our, our uh, wonderful guest here tonight, but if you look closely, you might see a cello right back here behind him. And, and perhaps we'll find, now where did that come that's from? That's where it yes, is. Yes, that's where, you've been I, looking for it. I, I thought it was in the cab. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. 
Well, we're, we're delighted to see you with the cello. And perhaps, perhaps he hasn't volunteered, perhaps we can coax him uh, to play before this is over. We're going to have a conversation for just a while, and then we'll eventually turn it over to you for questions. Um, and we'll probably be here for 7.15 or so, or it depends. Uh, last night, a freshman here at the college called his dad uh, and said, Dad, I just had a wonderful Harvard moment. I've been studying for midterms. I've been glued to the library, but last night I was able to go home. And as I was walking home in the cold, I went by a chapel, and there was this music emanating from the chapel. And it was just so gorgeous. I had to look in. I took a peek in. And there, this Harvard moment, there was the most acclaimed classical musician in the world, Yo-Yo Ma, conducting a master's class for Harvard students. What a wonderful experience for a freshman. What a wonderful experience and what a great Harvard moment this is for us tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you did for did you just make that up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, raise the like you raised the bar for everybody. You know that. <laughs> That's a very good story. <laughs> <You know. laughs> uh, let me ask you a question. We, most of us are familiar with uh, the chronicle of your youth. You're born to Chinese parents, uh, learning to play at four, uh, living in Paris, and then coming to the United States at seven, I think you came. So you had this sort of tripartite set of loyalties, affiliations, and loves, uh, and went on to Juilliard, uh, and then made the decision to come to Harvard. And what I've never really understood very well, because you've become such a citizen of Harvard, what was it about that experience when you were an undergraduate that made a difference in your life? Well, I think um, to this day, I often say that there's nothing I've done since college, any project, any way of thinking, that didn't actually start in some way, uh, the seeding of which started in, in, in college. So it was a momentous time for me. Um, and when I think back as a 58-year-old, um, you know, we all have earlier ages that we think right. we are. Well, yeah. what, type, what age do you think you are? I think I'm 17. Do you really? Yeah. When you turn 60, I think you'll get a little older. Than really? Yeah, that's I'll, what I've I'll become that. 18? Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, how old do you think you are uh, in, about, in your head? My wife thinks I'm about 14. 14, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but what's very interesting, and, and you know, I, it, you think I'm joking, but actually I'm not, the, because the other age I feel that I'm very close to is when I was seven. But that was when we moved yeah, from France to the United States. Mm -hmm. So those are two actually dramatic changes hmm. in my life that somehow, you know, it's, they weren't necessarily you know, traumatic or whatever, yeah. but they were such big changes that for me it locates the time that, you know, the linear time of, of my life. So interesting. Yeah. But now, dig a little deeper. You majored in anthropology? Here? I majored in music, when I, but I would have majored in anthropology. I took many courses, and it was probably, for me, the liberating subject huh. that allowed me to look at my own background, mm -hmm. you know, the tripartite uh, background, as you, as you put it so mm -hmm. succinctly. Um, and, and that allowed me to look at each culture and its value systems, mm -hmm. you know, the priorities that each culture places on the value, and, and suddenly those places in, uh, that were kind of muddled in my mind gained a little bit of clarity. Did that also contribute to the sense that you've expressed that the sounds of music are sort of the surface, but what, what, what's important is also what's going on underneath? and the question of humanity and who you are and your beliefs, your passions? Well, that's a, that's a very, very good question. I, I think that um, uh, as a young person, I always, I had a wonderful teacher uh, here at Harvard, Len, um, Leon Kirshner, mm -hmm. composer, and he used to look at me and say, yo, yo, you haven't found your sound. You haven't found your style. Your sound. Your sound. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. You know, you know how people who 
right now they're finding their voice artists need to find their voice well you know i was told <laughs> you didn't find you don't have yourself he says i'll give you 13 years and, you know he made up he made up something and says and maybe then you'll find the sound so and then he would used to joke with me many years later about that but as usual with every even humorous statement there's a bit of truth in it and i think uh the sound that whatever you think you find uh, for me, was not the s necessarily the sound of the cello, but it's how the cello adapted to different styles of music and then could find its place within. Mm. So that, you know, because I think one of the things I learned at Harvard is that, um, you know, Harvard doesn't like superstars. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 like that. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was told. You got that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and um, so we were, as students, we were always told you have to find you know, the voice of the composer. So let alone, alone finding your own sound, right. you have to kind of look at the voice of the composer and really try and understand it. And then you fit. We don't want some young, brash person to say, you know, I've got a lot of energy and, and technique and I can do this and look at me, I'm so fa fantastic. No, nah, they said, no, 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 you gotta just, you know. You, and and I, I swallowed all of that. Mm -hmm. I believed it. And, and I think, uh, so I took on with the anthropological interest as well as, as my music teachers beating, beating down on me and saying, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta find, you gotta find your way and I was looking for that way. And gradually, I think, if I had a sound, it would be, you know, that would be the evidence of all the experiences I've had. Mm -hmm. And that sound is just the tip of the iceberg. Because encoded in, you know, a singer's voice or a writer's words, you have, you can kind of trace when experiences get filtered and and uh, become organically part of what they what they express. So, but it is it, in many ways a writer has to find a voice, a speaker has to find a voice. But as a musician, you have to find your own voice. Absolutely, it's interesting. And that and that voice comes from the sum total of who you are and your own passions. I, th I think so. It comes from wh where yeah. where you start off. But I think right. in the end, uh, it's it's really what you do with the voice, mm -hmm. right? So you have a voice. Yeah. What do you choose to do? We have many uh, aspiring, emerging leaders here at the school and indeed all across the university in the college, of course. Um, and there are some who assume you can just sort of walk in and lead something and be terrific at it. Malcolm Gladwell makes the argument, as you know, that, that, that it takes 10,000 hours of work to become a master. That Mozart, took, if you look at his younger life, it really was, it took 10,000 hours for him to get to the point where he was writing the more mature music he was. I'm just wondering, from your point of view, as, as how much, how much of an effort for you it has been. How much, how much time have you poured in to become the, the, the master cellist? Well, I think I got many of those ten thousand hours front loaded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a Chinese parent, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I now, I my new word are feline parents, <laughs> <laughs> not tiger. Well, you know, they could become tigers. Right, and, right. You know, right. But sometimes, you know, we got to kind of. So it's it's just proportion and size. Yeah. You know, when you're little, they may seem like tigers. Yeah. And when you grow up, you know, they become smaller. <laughs> so, <laughs> so back to your question, the front loading, yeah. um, I think, uh, you know, both my sister and I had pretty much sort of a very, I would say, hothouse environment, very, you know, kind of uh, did a lot of work. I had to learn languages and all kinds of, at home. Right. And, um, but what that did was that that allowed a certain amount of freedom to explore for example, in college or later on, to kind of say, okay, well, I know how to put this together. This is a game I know how to play. But then what are the other places, what are the other environments that you want to explore, which were vast, which college was the place 
that kind of first opened my eyes to different ways of thinking other than what, I, what, what I'd experienced mm -hmm. before. As, as you've matured, it's been striking to so many that you've not only become the most recognized classical musician in the world, but that you've gone on to t talk about uh, music and leadership as a form of service. And you've, you've coined this phrase about the citizen musician that you talked about in the Nancy Hanks lecture last year. Could you tell us a little bit about where that came from and what that means to you? What, what, what is, what's going on in your head about where you are as a human being? Well, I, I think in the natural course of events, um, well, I, I met my North Star very early on in life. Mm -hmm. That would be my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, she's here today, and oh, she's not she? going to. She's right there. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Jill, no, she doesn't like being recognized. Okay. I just said that. I said that she, really she's hard, and hard to annoy her, but then that's yeah. another <laughs> part <laughs> We're, we're so. delighted you're here. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so we had children early, and, and one of the things you do as a parent is that you do anything for your child. Mm -hmm. Your child goes, you know, there's show and tell. You go bring the instrument, you go do show and tell, you do what, and, and in a way, just from living, you accumulate a number <coughs> of roles. And so I think that I'm an immigrant, mm -hmm. and as an immigrant, you wonder, okay, what is this country about? You know, what is its his history? Am I, is my relationship with the country only, does it only start from the point of arrival? But then how do I understand its history and make it my own? Mm -hmm. So there's, that's a constant process. Mm -hmm. and, and who do you, you know, we study the presidents, we study everybody, but, but what is my relationship to them or to people that came mm -hmm. before me? And, and that's something uh, uh, that, that I, you know, I always wondered two things, who did it and why? Mm -hmm. and that's my whole life. You could become a journalist. Oh, really? <laughs> Just ask the question. Yeah, Who are you question. and why do you do yeah, what yeah, you do? Right, yeah. Okay. That's a, could you train me? <laughs> because I may need a lot you of seem training. You seem to be doing very well right now. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But anyway, um, so citizen, it, you know, I'm, I'm old now. So a lot of, there are at least three generations of people that are younger than me oh. who, that, and I interact with them, and I don't know their world. But if I want to be part of the world, I need to actually understand what they're thinking, how they're thinking, what you know, what the millennials are like, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so for me, uh, be being a citizen is it's just basically looking at how uh, I can be useful, mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, especially when at a time when some people say, well, uh, the arts. It's an elite thing, which is therefore a bad word, and you know it's and and uh, and the music that I play, uh, I started from the classical tradition. That's you know European dead white male music, and I say, great. Then why am I playing it? You know, like what <coughs> what's is something is something wrong with this picture? And and I'm basically trying to, uh, well, first of all, to understand things, but then as a citizen, th just to try and find out how I can make a contribution other than at the voting. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, and, 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 and to what, help out. And is that what led to your vision of the Silk Road Project? And can you tell us now where that's come? Well, I think that's, uh, the Silk Road Project came from a lot of, a set of very different experiences. Uh, one of them came through, uh, uh, the wife of this man that is sitting right next to Jill, Merton Flemings, who's a, um, a wonderful scientist, material scientist at MIT. We're all parents in the same school. So mm -hmm. our children were friends. And um, Merton's wife, Elizabeth Ten Grotenhaus, uh, spoke to me about uh, the path of Buddhism mm -hmm. from India to China and how each place deals with it differently, but yet uh, the iconography often remains the same. So, so she actually gave me a way to look at sort of what is 
in the visual world uh, a way of tracing history that is um, that is culturally inspired. Mm -hmm. So instead of you know empires, and uh, and you could look at well, how did something travel? Mm -hmm. How did goods travel? How did ideas travel? And so so that was one beginning. Another beginning was from um, going right after the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. The next the same night, I had dinner with a number of people in Jerusalem, and the next day we went to, uh, through the Allenby Bridge, uh, to first to, uh, uh, to Petra to visit, and then went to Aqaba uh, and visited the, the Hussein family, and they asked me to, uh, on the way back to Tel Aviv, the next day, will you stop by Amman and give a master class and do a class? I said, sure, because she was the patroness of the, of the school. I did, and, and, and I listened to two lovely, lovely students, maybe like 18, 17 years old, and, and they played not so well, uh, but when I asked them, why are you doing this? What does this music mean to, to you? They gave answers that were so magnificent and so illuminating and so poetic. I thought, you know, this is incredible. These people have an unbelievable inner life that is going on. And in many ways, the contrast to the ex that experience was, uh, was I would go into conservatories in the States and where the training is very different and people play extremely well but if I ask them, do you have a question? It says, yes, how can I you know, succeed at that competition? Or how can I do that? It becomes less, uh, it's the involvement of, of whatever the representation of a piece might be mm -hmm. was a slightly different kind. And I just thought, you know, that, this is a very interesting thought. And that, that day, I had the thought of saying, you know, it would be great to create a Middle Eastern ensemble of people just, and between what Elizabeth said to me about the path of Buddhism and, and being in Jordan and seeing, mm -hmm. uh, seeing those two young students, you know, those were the germs of, of the idea. And certainly after uh, uh, 89, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, we had suddenly 16 countries who, that, that we can't pronounce their names. What, you know, and I was sort of proud of having traveled quite a bit, but I knew nothing hmm. about those new countries. And I thought, you know, this is, well, if this, but let's try and explore whether, whether there's a way of looking at uh, a culture or at music uh, through traditions and, and finding how, what traditions stay the same, what traditions change, mm -hmm. and why, how they get renewed, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, you, you developed this and in the Hanks lecture and elsewhere. You've talked about the edge, the importance of the edge, and use the metaphor of the, of, of the forest meeting the savanna, and 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 where that edge is formed, there's the greatest diversity in nature. Right. You have the uh, greatest new life. Uh, yes. Right. Exactly. Um, and do you and find that in cultures then? Well, that's that was an idea that I. I what that was first expressed to me by uh, my son's eighth grade math teacher mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Joanne Larrabee. And, uh, and she said, oh, you're thinking about these things. Yeah, do you know about that term, edge effect? And I said, no, and kind of looked it up and, and thought about it. It says, wow, this is really interesting because so much of what I'm thinking about in, you know, in the making of instruments, in, in how people, cultures become very creative, mm -hmm. you know, the burst of, of invention in, in the Enlightenment or during in the classical period, what, what motivated these people? And I started seeing that, you know, in fact, it is the meeting of two places, often unlikely, that spawns new ideas and new ways of, of thinking and of, of invention. And so that's something that 
you know, I, I'm still thinking a lot about because there seems to be still <coughs> a, a great, uh, a, a very rich vein to explore. You know, you take a, an ecological term. Well, why shouldn't it apply to humans since we are part of nature? You know, and and uh, and so does how how does that work in society? And mm -hmm. so that's well closer to home. Uh, uh, you've been arguing that there are three driving forces for society. Uh, there's economics, there's politics, and culture. And culture is sort of taking a back seat in too many time, in too many places. And that what you want to do is lift culture to be the, the, on an equal playing field. Does that sound crazy? Doesn't sound crazy to me at all. You I'm sure? No. Can I have that in writing that you say, <laughs> David Gergen says this is not a crazy idea. I think it's, I think it's inspiring. So, uh, yeah, so where I come from, okay. I, I would argue that the breakdown in politics is not about individuals, not necessarily about ideology. It's about a breakdown in political culture, mm -hmm. a breakdown in civic culture. And there's, there's, so when you come and talk about the artistic culture, musical culture, that brings true to me mm -hmm. as something that would could dramatically change the way we are as people, how we live with each other. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I think you've come to symbolize. It's not just a great musician, but trying to understand humanity and trying to make a difference in that. And uh, you know that's been, I think, from my point of view, you're there to the walking. You won't say it, but when you talk about citizen musician, that's what I sort of see you as. I know you say that's your aspiration, but it seems to me you've really reached that already. Well, we're trying to explore the beginnings of you know, w what it might mean if we use a term like that. Yeah. You know, how could that apply to people? I think mm -hmm. I meet so many young people and as they, they're, uh, who are incredibly talented, and this is the world they face. They're young, they're, they're passionate about what they do. Uh, they think they have a contribution to make, but they're also worried that they whether they can afford to have an apartment, mm -hmm. and whether they have health care, whether and so they're so the the talent and the wishes of a lot of people don't actually get interrupted by other, mm -hmm. you know, by other things. And I'm thinking <coughs> that you know there's there's so many people with lots of energy. So when uh, when Wendy Cobb started Teach for America, I mean she couldn't get a job teaching because she had just graduated from college. So she tried another way to right. do things. And we're saying that, you know, there are lots of models of people who have explored other ways and at a time when we're really concerned about job creation. Right. Uh, why not, in sen and since traditional venues may be far and few in between that could have a job for you to do this very specific thing, why don't people actually look at uh, try another way as one of the possibilities to look at, you know, what the needs are in society that are not being met at, at this moment for whatever reason, and can you do something to impact yeah, and that? And you're trying to do that through music. Uh, this, this alliance, this partnership you formed with the Chicago City Schools mm. and Chicago Public Education has really been quite striking. Tell, tell us a little bit more about that, what you're... Well, I think, I think one of the things, so I, I'm a consultant at, I'm the Judson and Joyce Green consultant of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. an organization I've known for you know, many decades, and they have a particularly enlightened administration. Um, and, and what, uh, and under Ricardo Muti's leadership, who said to me when, when uh, I asked him, what do you love besides music and your family? He says, well, I love children, I love the environment, and I actually care a lot about people in jail. That's from Ricardo Muti. I said, wow, that's really interesting. I've never met another maestro that you know, said these things. He says, let's, let's do something. And, and in the process of working there, you know, he's gone to detention centers, played for incarcerated people, and, and we've helped people create musicals and whatever. But, so what's the purpose? And the pur one purpose is, uh, as many educators want to do, is to actually break down the four walls of either the schoolhouse or the music hall. And, and everybody in Chicago knows the Chicago Symphony Orchestra is a great orchestra, but actually 
fewer people have actually gone into the hall. So why not spread out and, and go to hospitals, go into the schools, work with the public school system? And at CPS, I'm, I'm extremely proud that a consortium of people, uh, you know, the CSOs included among those, uh, but within the Chicago public school system, uh, Mario Russo and, and another person at Ingenuity uh, Incorporated, which is an NGO, uh, worked indefatigably. I hope that's a word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, for a number of years, and had town halls and, and asked parents, um, citizens, what do you want in your schools? And they said, we want arts, arts, arts. And so really by popular demand, they, so for the first time in 40 years, they created a, uh, a culture plan. And then more recently, uh, they voted for uh, arts, arts integration, as in theater, uh, dance, music, visual, uh, uh, to be part of the core curriculum. Hmm. Now, that's immense. Uh, so that's literally having STEM to STEAM, you know, turning. Right, yeah. Uh, but we'll do that later. Explain that. People know that. Okay, yes. the, the term STEM is, you know, is science, technology, engineering, math. And everybody says this is the most important thing. I'm just saying, well, you know, why don't we add an A uh, to that and add the arts, culture, and humanities? And in fact, uh, I think the person who may have coined that is, the, is John Maida, who's the president of WISD. So I just want to give uh, credit. I think he may have coined that. But anyway, um, so, so the, uh, I'm very proud of these two things. That some, the orchestra, now when they go on tour, when they were recently in Russia, they went into orphanages. They spoke to the, I mean, they really are doing this work that generally organizations don't do when they're, they're on tour, but they make it part of what they do when they went to Mexico, the same thing. And, and so the idea is, is that we're turning a, a great and an unbelievable a musical organization into a cultural organization that is you know, wide open to the community and trying to see sort of like, well, this is how we can you, do you, contribute. Are you seeing much impact? Uh, well, I think the impact of, of uh, the core curriculum, I think that's one thing. I think that, uh, I think, I don't like to use the word branding, but I think uh, it's, it's interesting that when we go, when I go back to my hotel, I will get the doorman and say, you know the thing that you did in, in uh, Pilsen in the Mexican neighborhood last night was fantastic because we really did go into the neighborhoods because they own the orchestra. I mean, this is their group. And, and so by going into, and Chicago is very proud of its na neighborhoods, so you go into each neighborhood and, and you have, or into uh, a high school, you have just a very different kind of impact than by, let's say, bringing people into Orchestra Hall, which is a beautiful hall, to say, okay, now you're gonna get a bit of culture. No, we are coming to your house. And because we would like to be part of your house. Wow. You really could put culture up there, back where it belongs. No, it's like what politicians do with all the chicken dinners they have to eat, you know. Right. So you go into I hope you don't have to suffer through those, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, there's nothing wrong with yeah. a good chicken dinner. Now, you're in the early stages of conversation about a 10 year project. Yeah. And we here at the Kennedy School often talk about social entrepreneurs, and you're talking about culture entrepreneurs. Well, I think uh, uh, one of the, you know, it's strange meetings. So Laura Freed, who is the CEO of the, the, the Silk Road Project, and, and I were, and uh, Jill and I, we had, I think, dinner uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, with, with Nitha Noria, who's the, the dean of the business school. Right. And we're talking, we're just talking about various things and, you know, uh, uh, no specific agenda. And I says, oh, I think I, I understand what you guys are trying to do. Um, you know, we just want you to know, 10 years ago, uh, pe 
people couldn't go to the B school, probably to the Kennedy School. Also, I don't know. Maybe you're way ahead of the game, and you know, uh, but you couldn't study social entrepreneurship. But today, and just like what your dean just told us, uh, you know, people go to the business school specifically for to to learn what they can do to help in the social entrepreneurship area. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, uh, and uh, I understand that 25% of the Kennedy School students actually go into some form of, of public service or nonprofit work, which is amazing. That's fantastic. Um, so he continues to say, well, you know, you, maybe cultural entrepreneurship could be, you know, one of those new fields that people can, you know, you can, if you can collect <coughs> the, the energy and the talents and the imagination and, and um, and you know the different skill sets of people who work in arts and culture, that could become a field. And so the dean of the the uh, of the arts and humanities, Deanna Sorensen, uh, worked with uh, Dean Noria to actually start a uh, and with the Silkwood Project to start uh, a a challenge of saying, well. Any student in the university, if they have an idea and they want to kind of, you know, bring it to life, uh, they can apply. There will be prize money and, and then the chance to work at the innovation lab and with faculty to actually nurture that idea until it becomes real. So this is this is one pathway that that's been created by wonderful people to try to kind of. Encourage. And we had the first, the launch of the first one last year. We're going to have another one this year. So, so this is a continuing thing, and I believe a growing, uh, one one path that's growing. And I think, and I've been going around, just looking at incredible people around the country that have been doing things, and we're thinking, you know, that you can also write down those cases, right. you know, and so that people can study them and learn from best practices and what right. worked, what didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's one way to deal with, uh, with issues in a society where there's less and less room for, oh, well, you know, we must deal with this problem and forget right. this problem, or, or it becomes a political football, or it becomes whatever. Uh, we know that culture uh, does not it's really easy to destroy something that's built up. It's really hard to build it up. So I think it's very hard for, if you want to grow something, to have those interruptions for the young people as well as for organizations. Well, I, I, I know Dean Elwood is anxious to, uh, eager to explore this further as a conversation. And, and please know, we've, one of the things we've been blessed with here at the Kennedy School is people who come through, your friend Damian Wetzel, uh, came here to the Kennedy School as, yes. as he was retiring from New York City Ballet right. and uh, then used this education to go forward in New York City. And, and he's, he's done, done incredible things. He's doing he wonderful things. You were one of his teachers. Yes, I was. Right? was uh, we were pleased to have him in the classroom. He made a big difference here. That's wonderful. Yeah, he was and you noticed him when he was a, a, a student and you've kind of followed up with him. Absolutely. Well, I, I, actually, my wife knew more about him than I did. Uh -huh. but, but she said, well, you used to meet his wife. <laughs> you know, she was also a, a dancer, as you know. Unbelievable. And, uh, but uh, Damien was a star student here and has really done, I think, extraordinary things in New York and with Aspen. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of our thinking has come from working with Damien. Yeah. He's helped us with our um, end of the year uh, events with the New York City schools. We'd bring them together. They would create their own sort of program that yeah. refers back to their year of learning. And I mean, he is absolutely, he's one of my heroes. You know, I, yeah. I, I look up to him in, in terms of, of, of his focus, his energy, his right. imagination. And yes. just and Re you know, Reynold Levy, who runs the of Lincoln course. Center, yes. he's coming here next year to the Kennedy School. How he's, wonderful. Yeah, he's going to be joining us here in the second semester of next year. I think that's right, Max. Yeah, the second semester of next year. So we've been looking that's, forward to that as well. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, You know, it's so funny because I first met him maybe probably 25 years ago uh, when he became 
the, uh, the, the, the cultural sort of presenter at, uh, or the president of the board of uh, the 92nd Street Y. Mm -hmm. And then he went from there to AT&T. Right. Right. And then, uh, so, so I've been following his, you know, uh, all his, his uh, accomplishments and how great that he's yeah. coming here. And, and that would be a wonderful thing. Congratulations. Sure. That's Let me ask you one last question. And, and, and maybe we can, I see that cello warming up in the background. Yeah, the, it's uh, it's the, getting uh, a little hot here. <laughs> You spoke to the young global leaders in Davos, I guess, a couple of years ago, and they asked you for, for your advice for young aspiring leaders about their lives and how they should plan and think about if you really want to make an impact on the world. I'd just be curious if you could offer a couple of thoughts to this group. Um, just say that again. I was actually yeah. distracted because I was actually thinking, what am I going to play? Yes, and, I understand. And, <laughs> And, and I, was I was distracted actually, by that thought too. But I, I mean, so I, I was actually debating, sort of like. I, I'm just, I'm just as you as you have young people coming up now, and there are so many students here at the Kennedy School, at the college, at the business school, and elsewhere, who are going to have an enormous impact on the world. And I just ask eager for your what's your advice to them about at this stage of their lives about how they can prepare themselves better to make a difference. Wow. Um, you know, <laughs> I think uh, Steve Seidel said once, uh, if you want to be successful at, at, at the School of Education, get yourself a theory, right? Didn't you say <laughs> that? Right? Get yourself uh, a theory. Yeah, a yeah. theory, you know. Yeah. So I, I, think, uh, I think everything we do is between, you know, having the concept and, and getting to the reality of things. You know, that's really the... the the crux of things. And so whatever you're doing, I know from my own life is that I get very uh, blinkered. You know, I must do this. This is on my to-do list. You know, you have to write lists every day. I hope you don't have to write lists every day because maybe you're too young <laughs> and maybe your mom tells you what to do. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, uh, my mom's too old to tell me what to do. I tell her what to do now, <laughs> which is a, it's a very different thing now. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I would say that you know the the real benefit of focusing on something uh, is, on the one hand, to go very deep into it, but on the other hand, is to also build greater awareness, which if you're completely in something, you can go, you know, you can discover the world through digging very, very deep. But you also need to kind of come out and of, of that hole and look at the world. And, and I think what, the, for example, what culture, what the arts do, it actually stimulates all your senses. And, and it brings a greater awareness of your everyday environment. And as you, you know, go from your dorm to your apartment, your hovel, <laughs> just kidding, uh, into the school, uh, you know, just look around. Like, look a little bit more carefully and look again and see who's walking by. Think about who they are, what their lives are like, what your life is like, and just Construct, just spend a little bit of time doing that because just by doing that day after day, you build an awareness that actually goes with the theories and all that, and you, you want to bring the two closer all the time. I think it's, uh, it, it's I've had to learn uh, the hard way because playing the cello was easy for me, I could solve a lot of problems in a short period of time that I get very impatient. And so you're obviously all really incredibly capable and bright people. Maybe everybody tells you that all the time, but, but what I'm saying is that it's actually, it's one thing to understand your own process but it's actually even more important 
to understand someone else's process. So I can tell you that when I perform, uh, I'm not the most important person in the room. The audience is the most important person in the room. So it really doesn't matter what beautiful theories I have in my head and how much I know something. It's, it's really my job is to make sure that something that we're sharing with one another stays in your mind, stays in your memory. And so that's, you know, so in whatever you do, and you're going to have to be very active in whatever, just make sure that the things that you do really uh, get to where they really need to. Check in on that. You know, make sure that that long arc is, is absolutely, you know, that there are no interruptions. Look for where the interruptions are, because there are always interruptions. You know, what's the thing? And often it's the thing that people haven't thought of. So, so, so that's where looking carefully, and not just in the way, in your habitual way, but actually expanding a little bit more, I think is really great. You know, do the AT&T thing, you know, reach out. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you would like me to play something? We would like to coax you into doing it. Coach. Co okay, coax. coax. Oh, coax. coax. I'd like you to coach me. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So, coax. Uh, so, so, I don't know whether to, uh, uh, I, I'd like to maybe try an experiment. I also have to put my trousers legs down. Um, so, um, I'm thinking. So, uh, let me try something on you, okay? Uh, I'm going to just play the end of a piece of music, and, and I'm going to try and test your, uh, your ability to fill in the gaps. Okay? Now, so basically, I'm going to play a piece of music that's about two minutes long. And somewhere around a minute and 15 seconds, let's say. Uh, so will you help me, Mike, just for now? So basically, there is a note that I can't play and hold on to. So I need your help. And I'm going to first demonstrate this uh, with Mikey, Mike Block, uh, wonderful cultural entrepreneur. At age 31, he's done amazing things. I look up to him. And uh, so he's daddy block now. So uh, uh, we're gonna, he's going to fill in that note. And then I'm going to ask you to sing it at the right time uh, with him so that we actually get to the end of the piece. Because you become the thrust and the propulsion for the piece that can take it to another level. OK? So are you, are you ready? Yes, sir. OK, so now, what's the best way to do this? Uh, uh, so I'm going to, there are two things that are going to happen in this piece. I'm going to go blithely along, and you're going to say, oh, it's lovely, it's beautiful, nice music. <laughs> I hope you're going to do that. Uh, and then, and then, at some point, it's going to stop. That's like one of those interruptions that we talked about. Yeah. What happened? Something very different is going to happen. That's one thing. First, the interruption. I'll stop. I'll look at you. You'll know. Then I'm going to go now from the interruption to the end, because just a little bit into it, he's going to play that note that you're going to sing when I play through the whole piece. OK, you guys game? All right, all right. So this is how it goes. So uh, this is after uh, interruption, stop. OK, then the.
you heard that, okay? Are you game? So basically, um, all of you stand up. <laughs> all right. Now, so basically, we're just going to practice this one. Can you sing a version of this note? Very quietly at first. Great. You are very talented. <laughs> you all get check plus plus and a gold star. Okay? So so now the rest of you, now if you're willing to stand for like a minute, get to the interruption, and then Daddy Bloch is going to play the daddy note, which is going to give us the sustenance we need to finish the job. Okay? So here we go. What? Can you repeat from the last note, too? You can all morph into the last note, and we're going to rely on your talents to get there. OK? So, so here's the beginning. So, yes. <laughs> Thanks, my team. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bravo. Give your head, give yourselves a big pat on the back. This is just great. I can't remember a moment like this. The Kennedy School is wonderful. The, uh, we, have ca we have microphones. Time for a few questions. They're here and here, here and here, as they often are. Always start, uh, end, please, with a question mark. And one per customer, the old Joe Nye rules. Uh, one per customer. So <laughs> who, would, who would like to come forward? No double dipping. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> no double dipping. Where, yes, please, here. Identify yourself, if you would, please. Thank you, good evening. My name is Allegra and I'm from MIT, but I also take classes here. <laughs> I'm very curious and very moved by the place between the two worlds. And my question is, do you see technology as a place where these worlds meet and how does it inform your practice? Thank you. Well, I think, uh, first of all, without the technology we have, I don't think we could have the Silk Road Project. Uh, you know, it is only because that we have uh, today's internet that we could bring the internet that we could bring the internet of antiquity 
into present form. That in, it's only because of technology that we can have instruments <coughs> who play at different decibel levels be able to match and be able to be in one room together. So I think uh, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that the, uh, the, so today's technology, in terms of the internet, is obviously it's a huge delivery system. But what we want to do is to make sure that what are the deliverables and that we want to make sure that the deliverables are not just contentful, but are given in, 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 in the right form, you know, with, with, with the right values. And, and so I think that's something that we, we work on. Thank you. Please. Uh, Sir. Yo, Yo Ma, I, I'm, my name is Ben Bolter, and I'm a Harvard alum. Um, the, the question I have for you is you talked about citizenship in a very broad context. And I wanted to ask you kind of a philosophical question to kind of get at your notions of citizenship. You talked about your inspirational journey to America. There's been other performers that have been foreign born that have come here that have taken on a political identity. Um, but our constitution specifies that people that are not born in America are not eligible to become president. Now, I know that you may not aspire to run to be president, <laughs> but what I, what I wonder is, with regard to citizenship, should we see for, uh, foreign born immigrants that come here uh, having enjoying equal status, or do you, or do you, with your own experience, see the wisdom in uh, the Constitution as it uh, relates to that issue? Hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I, I am, you know, I, I'm, I believe I'm a human being first, and a citizen second. I'm a musician third and a cellist fourth. Mm -hmm. And somewhere, I hope I'm a husband. <laughs> <laughs> I play a father, and, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But, but it's like we each have to kind of figure out those alignments and at different times. Um, so I think, you know, the way I think about citizenship obviously has evolved from you know, a, as an aging person in his twilight years. Uh, and, and that's what Manny says, and I'm just quoting him. And, and so um, I believe that, that uh, you know, there's the phrase that to whoever you've been given a lot, you should, you know, what's the phrase? Come on, you know that. Much is expected. Much is expected. I mean, you know, I'm a very lucky guy. I have a job. I have a wonderful family. And, and I always want to justify something in my head to say, why, why, why am I so lucky? And, uh, and also, as we are aware and look at different places, you see needs. And so it's, I mean, <coughs> it, it's, it's that basic. Uh, I think I became very, very interested in, in all this work in 2005 when Laura and said, you know, oh, we have to think about a 10th anniversary. What are we going to do? And I had a friend um, who was uh, Tim Knowles, who, who uh, also educated in somewhere in around this, these buildings. And um, he was in Chicago. He showed me a, a clipping of a front page article of the Chicago Tribune. And, he's, and in bold letters, out of 100 boys who entered ninth grade in the Chicago public schools, 100 boys, ninth grade, by the time they're 25, six will have graduated from college. And, but if you're African American or Latino, it drops down to 2.5 out of 100. And, you know, that was, it was like one of those moments in time. If I saw it another day, I might have said, okay, that's terrible, you know. But it just struck me that day. And because of what Tim does, because he's an educational, that it just became sort of like, I, no, we can't live with that. This is, just, this is just not possible. And so there is a moment when, you know, you get kind of, uh, you just can't not do something. So. My sense is that you've contributed so much to our country 
that it's unfortunate there's this kind of double standard for immigrants. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I, 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 I know this is kind of, maybe I didn't answer your question. Uh, double standard for immigrants? I don't know. Immigrants have to try harder, actually, because there's less safety net. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My Hi. name is Jen Tutak. I'm a recent alumna of the Harvard Kennedy School. On several occasions, I've had the great joy of being a member of your global audience, and each time I'm struck by your presence so much. It's so moving, the joy and the light that you emanate, and you've actually redefined my definition of a rock star, not just your musical talent, but, but this life that you project. And so <laughs> the, question, the question that I have for you pertains to an, an offhand comment that you made to Professor Gergen earlier this evening, why you do what you do. So I know why I gravitate to your performance and to your, your conversation because of this, this joy in life you emanate. But could you share with us, way back all the way to when you were four till now, why you do what you do? Sure, very easy. Uh, when I was four, I thought, you know, at the time when kids say, oh, I want to be a fireman, whatever, I was so confused, I just wanted to understand. That was my big goal in life. I just wanted to understand. And it took me, uh, I'd say, the next 45 years of doing lots of things, music, etc., uh, that made, and it wasn't until I was 49 that I realized that all of the things I'm interested in is because I really love people. That's it. <laughs> Please. Perhaps that will segue nicely into my question. I'm Allison Pingree. And it's a pleasure to, to have you here. I work at the SLATE initiative here at the Kennedy School, which stands for Strengthening Learning and Teaching Excellence. So we work to support excellence and innovation in the teaching that goes on here at the Kennedy School. Um, I was very struck by your description of when you are performing that the most important person in the room is the audience and not you, and that you want to leave your audience with something that they'll remember. And I couldn't help but think about analogies between that and the act of teaching. And so. I'm curious to hear you reflect on what you've learned about teaching by being a musician and what you've learned about being a musician by teaching. Okay, that's a very, very good question. Uh, I'm not gonna answer it, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I can tell you that when the Silk Road first came to Harvard, uh, we were faced with a dilemma because None of us are the world's expert on anything. You know, we may have some mastery over things, know certain traditions, we care about things. So how do we interact in at a university that you know, has this kind of aura, a reputation, et cetera, et cetera? And, and so we came up with, I think, a very a conniving plan, which is to say that we just know what we know. We're not trying, so if we're trying to do a class or something, uh, we're just sharing what we know. And in fact, we think that the best teachers are always learning and the best students by being passionate about what they're learning are always sharing and teaching. So in fact, I don't see a difference between the two. And so if you're in a state of striving to learn, you know what the, the seek, dirty little secret is that you actually stay, uh, you feel more alive. If you're constantly learning, you're constantly reorganizing your, your neurons. And it's like, you know, you're learning new things, not just like you're learning new things within your field, but that you're actually, you, you have to create new synapses, you know, you have to do that. And, and, and then I made another sort of jump, and may, I may be crazy, but I, I think that, that where a performer and te teaching have in common is that the only reason to do either one truly is if you can make the learning or the performance memorable. 
Because how good is it if you go home tomorrow and you say, well, I knew I did something last night, but I have no idea what it was. And how awful is it that a student aces his or her exam, but crams, you know, you know, and then says, okay, thank goodness, I got it, it's done, I never have to deal with this ever again. That's really, that's a poorer version of education than, than I think what you and I are, are trying to, to talk about. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, Mr. Ma, my name is John, I'm from the Kennedy School. Welcome back to Harvard. I have, to be, I have to begin my question with a confession of sorts. Okay. Uh, oh. As also a son of immigrant Please parents, I, as a son of immigrant parents, I also sat down in front of a music stand, in front of a metronome, in front of a full-size cello that was too big for my frame, and I heard my mom say, practice. And I was like, Mom, I don't want to practice. And she was, practice. And I learned quickly that America's not always a democracy. And so... <laughs> Um, but I kept complaining, and she said, look at Yo-Yo Ma. He plays the cello well. <laughs> <laughs> he plays the cello well, and he went to Harvard. And, so <laughs> and I quietly said to myself, curse you, Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> me. Yeah. But it piqued the curiosity in me. Uh, in me, and I wanted to know more about you. And so that was right when you re released Hush with Bobby McFerrin. I think it was in 1991. And that changed my perspective of the cello. Um, I found out that cello could be fun. I don't have to play these old, boring songs. And the music on the CD, like Flight of the Bumblebee, Hush Little Baby, I mean, those were actually fun for me. And it changed my perception, and I wanted to play. And so I first wanted to also thank you for having the courage and creativity of doing something a little bit unorthodox because I think it saved a young boy from going to the dark side, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I would have defined as a life without music. So my question now is this. Um, given all the passions and portfolios that you have, what do you think you'd be doing if you weren't playing the cello? Huh. Um, well, knowing that now, you know, since for the last nine years, I've realized I really love people, um, I think I would probably be involved in some form of work with people and knowing of my interest in anthropology and cultures, probably working in some form and, and you know, learning is part of my life and, and sharing what I've learned is part of my life. So I, I'd say those values and interests remain probably constant or consistent and so I'd be doing something in, in that, that encompass those interests. And I'm sorry for causing you all this trouble. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> See, it's so easy to inspire hate. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Good evening. My name is Anna Meschian. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm a graduate of New England Conservatory. Um, I studied with Patricia Zander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, actually inspired by the Citizen uh, Musician Project and Elsie Stemma from Venezuela, which is an incredible um, project <laughs> in Venezuela, um, music education project. I started a program in my home country, I'm also an immigrant, Armenia, and um, basically just trying to get as many kids as possible to embrace this idea, you know, instead of just being on this path of practicing by yourself eight hours a day and then just getting up on stage and being completely separated from your audience, trying to get as many kids involved in this. And the kids have been incredible in uh, grabbing onto this idea. But it, along the way, have, there have been so many people who have told me, you know, don't work with those kids who are pre-conservatory kids. Your, your job is so different from theirs. You know, the music schools that they go to um, have such a different mission than what you have. And I said, well, well, what is the difference? And they said, well, your job or what you're trying to do is you're trying to make people's lives better through music. And that completely confused me because I thought that was every musician's job. And part of the reason that I wanted to do this is because I wanted to bring my conservatory training um, to everyone. And so my question is, um, you know, in working with, all, uh, with this world of you know, music for social change, um, I always often feel pain that there's a, there's a separation of you know, the social change kind of music and then the good kind of music, the very high art. Um, and 
for me, that there's for, for me there's no distinction. And I'm wondering, what do you think is the well, do you think this is a growing pain, or do you think there's some obligation that we have to make sure that these two don't become so separate, and so so we don't lose the high art? <laughs> mm. If that if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think this is obviously very individual, but on the on the institutional side, I could say that um, if we value teaching so much, uh, and or if rather if we know that education is so important, where do we place teaching on the hierarchy of value within any institution? That's a really important question. Uh, so in conservatory, where I also went, you know, teaching music ed was considered like, you know, the dregs. And, and we have these sayings, which I really truly don't believe, uh, when people say, well, those who can't do, teach. But you know, you have those words going in your head, and, and if you don't examine those words, you might just believe that to be true. Uh, and so I think what I can tell you my own experience is that by going to the show and tells with my children and then going into schools or any inner city schools and dealing with other, or opening myself to other cultures and loving the Duduk, for example, and, and what, what it has done, it's actually made me do better on both ends. I can relate more easily to anybody. And also, on the supposedly high end of, you know, is your Dvorak concerto better? Um, I think I'm a better musician. So I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. It's only when you silo those places and, it, it, and, and assign a value uh, that is not necessarily true. You can make it true if you say that's really the way it is. But if you believe otherwise, you can prove it. And you can prove it by actually getting better on all sides. We have two more. Time for two more questions, please. Hi there. My name is Carolyn Yi. I'm a first year at the college. Um, I'm on the JFK Junior Forum Committee. So I have a question for you on behalf of a Twitter follower. Um, the question is. <laughs> Come into the microphone just a bit more. Uh, the, sorry about that. Mm. Uh, the question is, how do you get your message across to people who don't see an intrinsic value in music, art, and culture? Uh -huh. hmm. Well, I mean, uh, 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 I think, you know, as human beings, we are multi-sensate. Some people are more visual, more oral, and people like to be tactile and whatever. I mean, I challenge anybody to come to me and say, I don't, I have no, va there's no value in this and whatever. If that person's a parent, I would be very scary for the child. You know, I, I think, um, I don't think there's, you're dealing with individuals who may say something, but you have to examine where that statement comes from. Who are they? And why aren't they saying that? I mean, that's back to the old question. I, I, I just think that uh, who is not moved by seeing a gorgeous sunset? Who is not amazed when you look out in the night sky and you see billions of stars? Tell me it's not beautiful. Tell me it has no, that, that wonder and awe that you might feel uh, is, has no value, doesn't inspire action, doesn't inspire thought. I mean, tell me that seeing the miracle of a birth, you know, of a child coming, you know, tell me that that's, you know, okay, we're gonna, I, I, I just don't, I can't, my imagination is too limited to conceive that someone would <laughs> actually uh, believe that, and so I would actually, say these things to them and say, you know, uh, let's talk about you, you know, what makes your life rich and filled with, uh, you know, where does your love for something come from? Thank you. Please. Hi, Mr. Ma. Um, my name is Michelle Lee. I'm a sophomore at the college and I'm studying anthropology. 
Um, <laughs> and I'm also a pianist, <laughs> so I really appreciate a lot of the things that you said. Um, just kind of looking back on my experience with the piano, I think I've had some of my highest and lowest moments in front of the instrument. Um, I think it almost feels sometimes like I have a relationship with it, even though it's an inanimate object, like um, maybe as if it were a sibling or a friend. So I'm interested to see how you would describe your relationship with the cello and mm -hmm. kind of how it's changed as you've grown up and kind of gone through life and, you know, gone through college and become a father and mm -hmm. hit those milestones. Okay. Well, I, I sympathize very much with your saying that you, you feel a relationship with the instrument from which you are expressing yourself, right? And I think, um, and I never think it's, the way I think of the cello, it's very simple. The bow arm, the one that draws out the notes, are my lungs. And the four strings are an extension of my vocal cords. So basically, you want to take that inanimate object and make it essentially an extension of your body, of your brain, of your thoughts. So it's what you want in your relationship with the instrument is to have the least amount of interruption or impediments between thinking something, wanting to hear something, and having it come out. The reason we practice is to actually diminish that distance of time between thinking something, having a concept, having an architectural plan for something, and then to say, okay, this is how we're gonna do that, and it just comes out. And, and, and that's, that's the reason, I don't think practicing, for example, to answer the earlier question is, uh, for its own sake is good, but having little goals in practicing actually makes something more familiar. You're building your own house, you know, mental, musical, cultural house in your head, and whatever, what you put into an instrument helps actually reveal, you know, Tina Blythe likes to say that we want to make education visible. It makes, you're making your thoughts audible. You're making your feelings audible. And that's, it's that, you know, cycle that you're constantly working on so that it becomes more and more fluid. Okay? The time has come. The time has come. <laughs> Um, the walrus said, C could you bless us with one final piece as we leave? No, I, I, I can't bless you with a final piece, yeah. but I can attempt to perform something that may refer a little bit to some of the things we've been talking okay, about. We will attempt to relate to it in a way that you said it's hard. Oh. It's been hard. It's been an extraordinary evening. We're so, so honored by your presence here, but we'd love to hear you one more. Okay, well, let me describe what, what I was thinking of doing because that's partially from a request that you were mentioning and, and I think, um, so we were talking about a lot of I ideas, some abstract, some more you know, humorous, some completely inane. And, um, and I'd, I'd like to put some, uh, uh, put a footprint in the ground. Let's go to some evidence of another piece of music uh, by Bach. And, and here's, so what I'd like to show in playing is, is that there's a piece of music that I play often at my friend's wedding. And I've, off, I've also played, unfortunately, at my friend's memorial services. And it's the same piece of music. So it seems like at first a contradiction, right? Uh, but, and, and there's one more thing. Uh, the one more thing is that, so Bach wrote for this instrument, which has four strings. But if you see, unlike the guitar, when you can play all six strings at once. There's, there's a curved bridge, so I can only play generally one string at a time, and at most two strings at the same time. 
if I want to play three strings, I could do that, but you know, it's not so pretty. So, uh, but he composed a piece of music for four voices. So how did he do that? Because I can't sustain four voices. And, and I, I want to give you an ex example of that, and then I'm going to play you the piece. Um, so maybe, uh, so if I play from, so Mike, who is so incredibly wonderful and does everything beautifully, is going to help me uh, make the impossible thing that Bach did actually make it come to fruition that you can actually hear all four voices at one time, three or four voices, right? And then I'm going to play you the piece without Mike, and we'll see what happens. So, so let's say we go from, okay? Uh, Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. So, so you know how he played Daddy Block earlier on in the first piece. Now, I would like you all to participate, but this time not by singing, but participating and using your ears that when you hear a low note, and, and I'm only holding on to it for minute seconds, you fill it in with your ear and keep it going, okay? And, and in doing so, I think what we're, we're, we're giving evidence that, you know, that culture and memory and effort plays a part in joining something together. Because alone, I can only suggest something. But in your minds, you actually make it complete. So whether it's an act of citizenship, cultural citizenship, you know, social citizenship, whatever it is, you are actually engaged in that effort. So I'm going to play you that complete saraban, and um, and and let's see how it comes out. Okay. Thank you. 
So, thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.